Everybody, welcome back. Happy Valentine's Day, lovers. Ooh, it's la, your la. favorite men. That's right. It's Kevin. It's Adam. It's me, myself, Trey Roland, and we are here to bless your V Day with our own video mailbag. We've never done one of these before. We took all of your wonderful suggestions on Noel's 24 7 message board, the hottest community in the history of the internet. Trademark register cover a trademark. Oh Cannot be fact checked there. I'm only spitting facts. And we got all these wonderful suggestions. What we want to do, the guys over on Knowles 24 7 on the bench, they've become famous, infamous for their mailbag episodes. We want to do a film bag. That was pretty half hearted. Take- yeah, I know. I, I, well, my, my, my wife's sleeping upstairs. <laughs> it's actually Valentine's Day, even when we're recording. So, sorry. You guys know the enthusiasm's right there. Too, right, right too there. Shy. Built up too inside. shy. <laughs> Got to pick your battles, my man. You know that. <laughs> anyway, so on this edition, we wanted to take your questions and we wanted to do what we do analyze some film to either support our opinions, destroy other opinions. Either way, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a treat for your ears, it's going to be a treat for your eyes, as every episode of X's and Knowles presented by Knowles 24 7 is. So, we're going to be pulling up film. We're going to be reading your questions. Adam's going to be pulling up the actual thread where the questions came from. If you like it, let us know and we may do it again. We had to compile a lot of clips, it was a lot of work, which we don't mind. Because we're hardworking guys. We want to make sure you like the content. Anyway, Adam, I think you got a you got a cracker to start this first one off, right? Just a cracker jack of a question. Yeah, not a bad one from a I'm assuming he's a avid golfer, Tin Cup Knoll. Um Fuller seemed to find something in his blitz package late in the year this past year. Do you think we blitz less or more this upcoming year when taking into account the new bodies at linebacker and edge? So I think we've got two clips of that where we get an opportunity to look at some blitzing. And while those are running, we'll kind of discuss our and opinions I, on this. I think that uptick that he's talking about, we particularly noticed it at the second Just half of the Clemson game. Here's a blitz and boom, they didn't see it coming. He oh, I can watch it all day. I don't want to just listen to them. Yeah, so I, I think my response is, and interestingly enough about this play, they flipped this on the field, if I recall correctly, Bethune and, and Deloach. Mm-hmm. They kind of changed this on the field. This wasn't necessarily the blitz that was called or the pressure that was called, but they they made some adjustments on the field, which you get from veteran players like Deloach and, and Bethune and, and just an all-around veteran defense. Um, so from those regards, might not see quite the same type of stuff in the upcoming season as they're going to be a – a little less veteran on that side of the ball as they replace a ton of guys. Um, Fuller's always been a big blitz. Well, I should say he was always a big blitz guy. Well, really, we've got one year of data while he was in Memphis, but he blitzed quite a bit at Memphis. Mm-hmm. And then in his time at Florida State, it's been back and forth. Um, he's What's had it? years where he's pressured a, a fair amount. And then he's had years where he, he really just kind of relied on the front four to work uh, the, the, in 20 – what was it, 22 um, or 21, I'm sorry, with Jermaine and, and Keir Thomas. They they leaned into that front four pressure and allowed those guys to work because they were such a dominant uh, a pairing. What do you think about that question, Kev? you think we see more or less blitz? And it seemed like that second half of the Clemson game was really the kind of catalyst for FSU's defensive like renaissance, I would say. Yeah. They got more aggressive. They needed to against Clemson, and the, it really it – really, did them well for the rest of the year. Do you expect that trend to continue or do you see them kind of maybe dialing down? Obviously not the level of like high end, like ceiling talent with guys like Jared verse leaving on the defensive line, but you do have a nice core of solid, reliable dudes on the edge and the interior now to where it's, it might not be as big of a deficit as maybe the original poster of this question thinks it could be. Yeah. So I, I've always kind of questioned the, the concern about blitzing with, 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 Adam Fuller, I mean, every year, and, and I, I can t- I can pull up the stats here in a second. Every year, while the flu- there's been fluctuation in how much they've blitzed, they've always been a very efficient blitzing team. Mm-hmm. So even if you go back to last year, they did not blitz very much in 2022, but they were one of the best teams in, in the country at generating pressures when they blitzed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. This 2023 team looked a little bit differently, and I think early on they were expecting that defensive line to be able to, to control games. Uh, that to Jared Verse be able to, to win on the outside and get pressures. 
which, you know, if you can get pressure with four, like AB was saying, that's yeah. better than blitzing, right? Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's the ultimate. Um, uh, I, I think that, I think they found that they, they were more successful blitzing. I, I think that they genuinely felt by the end of the season that, you know, they were a really strong press man team that they could mm-hmm. trust their corners kind of pressing up on guys. And, w- and when that's the case, when you do have those cornerbacks, you know, that kind of frees you up to be a little bit more aggressive and, and bring in a, another guy or two. And um, so I, I do think that was a big thing. Florida State. So so Adam Fuller was a big cover three guy at Memphis for whatever reason. They liked running it. Maybe there was less capable quarterbacks in the in the AAC at the time that allowed you to play a little bit more cover three that allows you to be a little bit heavier in the box, have another guy down. But when he got to Florida state, they were, they were kind of getting picked apart. You saw them go to that cover four look a lot. So, I mean, early on, they were one of the top teams in cover four in the country when they were at Florida state. And recently this last year, there's a huge shift to go from cover four to man coverage. And when you're able to do that, you're able to bring some more pressure and I personally think that, you know, you're losing Renardo Green, you're losing Akeem Dent, but I think the secondaries might even take a step forward this year. I mean, your Finchel Cypress is going to be older. You have a lot of young guys that are very talented. And if you can trust your guys on the outside to man up like you did last year, well, then you might be seeing that when they bring pressure, they're another elite unit. I'm with you, and I think I think I don't know if they're going to blitz more than they did 2023, but I think the entirety of the 2024 season, from a pressure standpoint, is going to look like the back half of the 2023 season. I think that carry they on because they trust the secondary. Fintrell Cypress, AZ Thomas, you add in a neural little, another year for Conrad Hussey, Shaheem Brown, you add a Devontae Brown in your safety rotation. You bring in some, you bring in some age and experience and guys like Greedy Vance, who's always been very reliable. I think that, yeah, I, I think that there that pressure that we saw at the end of 2023, to answer the question, carries forward into the year. Moving on. Next question from yeah. Dark Poot. I'm sorry, <laughs> what? Yeah, it's a dude, Dark I don't know, pro internet culture. He wants yeah. to know what run schemes are going to fit FSU's personnel. The new personnel, I think, particularly he's referencing that they brought in from the transfer portal. What run scheme hypothetically fits FSU's personnel best with the new portal additions, of course, assuming uh, Maron, that the offensive line stays healthy, which of course it will. Why wouldn't it? So <clears> what, <throat> run, what run schemes do you guys think, Adam, just right off the bat? I know one in my head with the type of – with the guards that they brought in, like a Richie Leonard, Terrence Ferguson, DJ Uyangle being more of a power runner, Roydell Williams being a very decisive, I think a nice upgrade in the running back room. What run schemes do you think are going to particularly fit this these new guys, these new additions? Yeah, I th- and we've talked about it a little bit already this offseason as, as we've gone through – analyzing the different portal pickups and whatnot. But I think that they're building to be more of a duo style of uh, team uh, run, run scheme wise. Uh, mm-hmm. So focusing a lot on double teams, interior uh, duos, a very intricate play that uh, may require a video of its own, just to kind of describe in detail. But uh, the the duo play. If you think of Miami, Miami is a big duo uh, run game team. So, um, but I, I think duo. I mean, I don't think they're going to go away from counter though. Like that's no. Counter, I think it's going to stay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, counters. They, they're going to continue to do the things that they want to do. I mean, they yeah. Mike Norvell has always been a zone based run game, um, and he's going to go into some more power. Or I'm sorry, counter in his time at Florida State here recently. And then this year it wasn't quite as successful, but they still they still stuck with it. They found a little bit more duo as the as the year went on. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if they're going to have one favorite. Um, I think you're going to see some more duo mixed in. I think the fact that they've made a, a concerted effort to go get more size and bulk uh, along the interior of the offensive line speaks some volumes and maybe to some of their um, feelings about what they want to do with the run game. Maybe be a little more inside zone uh, focused with the size, focused, yeah. With, yeah. With some outside zone mixed in, and then and then you still 
run some of your gap stuff with uh, down and, and counter. Um, but duo is where I would go. I think it's where football is going from a run game standpoint. Um, I'm curious. We've talked about it a little bit also. They've built kind of a, an interesting offense with a lot of speed out wide and a lot of size in the middle of the offensive line. Are they looking to move away from 12 personnel, which they've been a heavy 12 personnel team here of late? Are they looking to move from that and become more of an 11 type of team? I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sold, <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> yeah, we and we got a clip of we got a clip of some duo stuff, right, Kev? That we can pull yeah. up and illustrate Bef- what Adam was talking about. Before we get too far, yeah. Um, so, you know, we we've all seen. By this point, if you've kept up with our channel, you've seen kind of counter and counter is going to look a lot like you've got these down blocks and then, you know, a a guard or something pulls over and you're trying to open up this gap. Right. So that's why it's called a gap scheme. Right. You've got one group of people blocking one way, one group of people blocking another. You get a big gap opened up. Do it a little bit differently. uh, Different. It's a man blocking scheme, which essentially just means that. Uh, instead of blocking it based off of everybody on this side blocks this way and everybody pulling this way blocks this way, which is gap. Um, you've got even, man. So wouldn't this even guy, define it as a man blocking scheme personally, but a duo. Well, I mean, it's heav- heavily reliant upon double teams, not just a man on a man. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, two men on on one man. Yeah. <laughs> two, yeah. So it. I mean, it's it's duo. You know. Okay whatever I've always heard it t- talked about like it's a gap scheme. So you're, you're getting double t- or a man scheme. Yes. You're getting double teams up mm-hmm. here gap. Um, and essentially instead of, um, instead of, you know, down blocking on a single person, people are looking to double team. They're looking to kind of get some vertical movement, get the running backs moving downhill. Um, and that allows you to be more, more of kind of a vertical, based run game right so instead Mm -hmm. of moving side to side like an outside zone um you're going to be trying to push the push the ball essentially down the defense's throat and you can see florida state's new i think that i we don't talk about starters i think somebody who's got a very good (laughs) chance to start at left guard you can see him on that duo block moving an all world defensive tackle in Braden fisk it's a very very effective scheme florida runs it a lot and I think Roydell Williams, with that speed, I mean, this could be a, a type of formation that we see. DJ Uyongle is very comfortable under center, out of the pistol. You've got speed at the slot now. We talked about Mike Norvell. He loves his compressed formations. I mean, dude, you could literally maybe see this play in Florida State's, in Florida State's playbook next year, and it, it, it would serve him well, I think, with the personnel. Yeah, yeah. I was going to agree with with you. You know, you have Roydell Williams, who's in a very similar mold to Keziah Holmes, and we'll kind of talk about them a little bit more later. But yeah, these are these are downhill guys. These are bigger bodied backs. They're thicker guys. They're not guys you necessarily are going to be wanting to ask to run side to side a ton. Um, I'm sure they'll be fine doing it. But th- to me, they they seem like more of a natural fit for these kind of downhill run schemes. Well, here's where I would counter Lawrence stole Philly is not a duo runner. He's never going to be no. a guy that you're going to ask to plug and, and read a linebacker and make, you know, make your offensive line be right and play inside the box as much. He can do it, but I don't think it's what you want him to do a lot of. Cause I Holmes potentially Roydell Williams has shown it at Alabama. He's got tape of running duo where he's run it successfully. Um, so that's why, they look, they, I mean, they're just always going to be balanced. Like, they're going to find well, things yeah. that... And the, I, real, I, the real answer to the question is I agree with what you're saying, Adam. They're going to do all the stuff that they've done in yeah, previous yeah. years. What's another thing that they could add in that would right. fit this personnel well? It would be sprinkling in stuff like this, maybe in the goal line where Florida right. State has had some issues running the ball. But I'm with you. Zone, ins- they might be a little bit better at inside zone this year. We'll they, see. They started running it more like from Miami on. So they ran it against Florida a couple of times and hit some big plays. The one Benson touchdown was it was a, a chunk run on duo, I'm pretty sure, if I'm remembering correctly. They ran it okay against Miami. Um, they seem to like it against certain fronts. I think they like it against odd fronts. So with a so. with a with a head up on the nose, right? Yeah, uh, Clay, yeah. So, Clay Fink posted something yeah, I think, on Twitter. Yeah, I think Clay's yeah. planning on doing some Twitter stuff on that. So 
Um, I don't know. It's, I'm curious with what they've built with this, you know, Keandre Jones and Richie Leonard and, you know, Mo's the only one that doesn't really fit kind of the mold, but we'll see what, you know, happens there. They're obviously mm-hmm. they're going to have a lot of competition along the offensive line as they've got a lot of bodies, but um, it makes some sense for them to run a little bit more duo. We'll see. All right. Yeah. I mean, if, if I'm looking at FSU's run game stats over the past four years, uh, so, so the way that PFF grades it is as a man run, um, to be, to be honest, no one just runs mono, you know, oh, yeah. it's only duo, right? So that's yeah, what's just being difficult. They consider a man run as duo. Um, mm-hmm. Florida state's, uh, their highest rate last year, uh, over the past four years, since the staff has been here was last year at 16%. They've been pretty steady running counter around 35% pretty much every year. So. I mean, again, that's going to be their staple. Yeah, that's what they're going to run. Um, uh, they're they kind of sit at twenty percent outside zone, and you know where they're getting this extra duo percentage is out of the you know kind of more niche wing T stuff like down, like AB was talking about, which it considers pull lead um, and inside zone. So they're they're running less of these zone inside zone looks, and instead when they're running inside, it looks like they're they're doing more man blocking, which, you know, is cutting hairs a little bit for, for a casual audience, but it's, it's a difference in kind of how, how they want to, how they, how they want to set up that, that blocking scheme and, and kind of the, the goal of the blocking scheme. We will be on the lookout for it more, but like I said, good thorough answer. You guys are not casual observers. You're the cream of the crop, the smartest (laughs) of the smart. And that's why you're here with us. Adam, let's move on to the next question. I believe it is from NRG Knoll. NRG Knowles. The one that we're going to tackle, I guess we could talk about do uh, the first one. We don't have film for it. Will the 24 team better or worse than the 22 team? Why? Um, I, that's it's so tough. I don't know. I like. It, yeah, I mean, we honestly, to spring yet. if I had to pick right now, I would say yes, and that's from obviously this is this is definitely subject to change. I feel like the pieces that they got out of the transfer portal are going to fit and be very cohesive with what the head coach and the coordinators want to do. That with the conjunction of a better level of high school talent to where I think, I think the results are going to be comparable between 24 and 22. I think at the end of the year, 24 will be playing better than 22 did at the end of the year. Yeah. I I don't uh, know. I got to see how they are in spring, man. It's tough to say, like, I think the 22 team overperformed a little bit. I mean, I would say they won 10 games and that was a massive deal. Um, But I do think there were some over overperforming, involved there you know i would say that you've built a like a nine win eight eight nine win four at least Mm -hmm. uh, with this 24 roster Uh, you've got a veteran quarterback that is is proven he's somewhat reliable um you've got a lot of pieces you're trying to get corralled and together in a short time span on defense um if i had to guess i would say that's probably a push like they're probably going to be similar i think yeah and wins is probably what you're looking at for this upcoming season, but it's not the easiest schedule in the world. And it's not the hardest either by any stretch. I'm not trying to say that, but uh, there's, there's some challenges that present themselves as you go along that schedule. I, and, I would say ahead. like the difference to me is I think that 22 team probably had better top end talent. Like I don't, I don't know if you have a receiver that's as as good as Johnny Wilson was in 22. Sure. I don't I don't, I don't think DJ's as good as Jordan Travis was in 22. I don't think that you have a defensive end as good as Jared Verse. But really what killed you in 2022 was the lack of depth, mm-hmm. right? You, Robert Scott goes down, Fabian Levitt goes down and you you drop what three games in a row. Yeah, and you're not going to have that decline after the first first string like you did back then, in in my opinion. So, right where, where I think maybe maybe you don't quite have some of the explosiveness that you you had in 2022 with you know Jared Verse and Jordan Travis. You're trading that for a solid team with a lot of depth that can do some serious damage in a in a conference that, like even even if you take that half step off the top of Florida State's roster they're still they're still better 
they're still more talented than, than virtually everybody else in the ACC. So like, yeah. um, that's, that's the, that's the difference for me. And I, I think because of that, you're seeing kind of an evening out of the two teams, right? Yeah, yeah I think so. And I, I, with the, with the, the three buys work out, the, a lot of the veteran dudes that they add out of the transfer portal, I think at the end of the year, while the win totals might not be the same, the way that like advanced metrics, like the F plus and the S and P, I think it's going to look at both of those teams pretty similarly before we get to the film question, cheese guy, favorite type of cheese to eat could be on anything. I particularly right now am a fan of Kerry Gold's Irish cheeses. They have a delightful, it's like a light Gouda aged slightly called the Blarney cheese. Big fan of that right now. Highly recommend. I just do. I just eat it off the block like a savage, but you could like put it on a cracker, I guess. If you're, if you're you know, if you're high maintenance. Uh. I'm a cheddar cheese kind of guy. I knew you'd be so goddamn plain Jane. What about you? Come on, Kev. You like a camembert, maybe a Gruyere. What do you like, bud? I don't know. I've been, I saw this question in the thread and I've been like not looking forward to it because I just don't, I, mean, I don't have a good, are you, you're not like lactose intolerant, are you? Love, and I'm just not a cheese guy. I don't oh, know. God, I love, I love, I love brie. I mean, they, oh, yeah, we're talking. Come on, fantastic. Guy. I love Gruyere on a burger, like on, a dude. little bit of Gouda. Like there's nothing wrong with any of these. But if I've got a staple, like a staple cheese that I'm eating on the daily, like it's Cabot white. Sharp yeah, that's a good brand. That's a good brand. Very nice. Right. That's okay. You redeem yourself for the guys who want free. If you want to get exotic, if there's a Greek restaurant in your town, I just had it this week. If you ever had Sang Sanganaki cheese, it's like a flowered like block oh, of Jesus, uh, tray. Jesus Christ. Uh, How are we doing tray. over there? Just wait. What it's like a flowered, in Iowa. It's a just wait. It's a flowered block of cheese. I think it's like Asiago or something. They uh they flambe it at the table and it's like the inside of the best mozzarella stick you've ever had in your life. I had it with some fresh marinara, Sanganaki cheese. Can, I'll it's say just, this: it's a treat. It's a some delight. of that. I've seen some of these videos on Twitter now, like where they heat up the the block the block of uh parm and make the fresh. Not that, fresh. but that's cool too. That's food porn. Yeah, I know what you're talking uh, about. That's oh, solid. Man. That's Sanginaki cheese, little flick. Yeah, dude, we, we'll give you all. We give you all things covered. Now let's get to the film, what people <laughs> want to see. What position group, Kevin, are you the most confident in? And I guess least confident in next year. And then we'll save the film for mine because I pulled the clips. Yeah, uh, you did pull the clips. Um, yes, so I, I would say that, you know, the position group that I'm – most confident in is probably going to be that cornerback room. Um, mm -hmm. I think you're bringing back a lot. I think, you know, Earl Little's going to be a really solid piece to slot in that, you know, nickel position. And even behind him, you have Greedy Vance, who's who's shown to be at least a capable backup. Um, I, I I think Fintrell Cypress is going to continue growing. There, there's, there's something there to continue growing with. I think he's going to be a nice veteran presence for a lot of these young guys. I'm high on Quindarius Jones. I think the staff seems to like him. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> I mean, he's he, he 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 got a lot of reps towards the end of the season, and, and mm -hmm. they were trying to work him in. Um, and then you've got a really talented freshman class coming in and gonna kind of push them. So I'm I'm really excited about that cornerback room. I think by year's end, we're gonna be talking about another just you know, FSU passing defense that whose whose stats are through the roof and um, I think a lot of that is because this this cornerback room is starting to look like how they've wanted to design the cornerback room from the beginning with just yep. an army of six foot two guys to just throw at the problem. It's a bunch of spaghetti arms just <laughs> everywhere. It's very difficult. <laughs> Least confident in Kev. Um, you know, I I think you've got to say linebackers. Um there's you have DJ Lundy who I, I think was capable last season, but um, behind him, you know, you, you have two freshmen that you know showed showed glimpses. You have Omar Graham who, you know, he had he had his ups and downs. I think people were a little bit too harsh on him mm -hmm. uh, last year. Kid from um, Bama has a lot of potential. Yeah, Sean Murphy. Um, so the two, I, the two freshmen are Justin Cryer and Blake Nicholson. Right. Yep. So depending on how Sean, Sean Murphy pans out, and I, 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 I expressed it in, in the Sean Murphy video that I think he's a talented guy. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, there might be some growing pains in the linebacker room. Okay. Adam? Uh, most my, least. I, I think most. 
I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say quarterback. Ooh, I, I I like this answer. I have a lot of optimism in what DJ is going to be for them in his money year. Um, because I don't think that they're going to ask him to be a Heisman winning quarterback. I think Mm-mm. that they're going to, they think they're going to ask him to be efficient and effective. I think they're going to ask him to, they're going to play to his strengths. They're going to ask him to throw the ball deep. They're going to let him make runs and short yards situations, hand the ball off to these running backs and, and let them do their work and let him be a compliment to the offense more so than the feature of the offense while also letting him flourish like I said, with throwing the ball down the field. Um, I think that that's important. And behind him, though, there's a lot of confidence in what Brock Glenn is going to be and maybe what he is already. Uh, sure, man, absolutely. It's at least the buzz that, like, hey, this Lewis, is a yeah. legitimate competition. Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, know I don't Brendan, know if I – Brendan, Brendan wrote that in one of his T uh, pieces yeah, re- recently. Thought. And I, I can understand why the coaching staff would want to certainly present that. Um, I, I, I actually, I do think it's true, but you know how exponentially these guys catch on to the playbook. It takes them a while to get it. And we've seen that with it. I feel like that's been a similar story for every transfer that's been here, Adam. It's like, Oh, it's a, it's like this highly touted guy competition. Yeah. And it is a competition, but when they get it, right. You see why we brought him here in the first place. Yeah. But Usually. But the, the point of it all is whether it is, isn't like, I don't think that that matters. Like, Every position is a competition. Um, there, mm-hmm. Brock's. That's just who Brock is. He's a competitor, so he's going to look at it as a true competition. He's going to expect to go out there and win it. Um, I, I just think that that he's going to be a good quarterback. I, I think that there's a lot to be excited about there. I think that the future's bright. And then Luke behind him. Like, if you didn't hear Luke's interview, you should probably take 20 seconds to go on the Knowles 24/7 YouTube page. Look that sucker up and go listen to that kid talk, and then Very go impressive. and then go on there again and look up the official visit where we had Zach and and Luke on and and talk to yeah. him and be impressed again because that's probably like, our best video. I'm not gonna lie, you need to go. Yeah, I tend to agree. That. <laughs> just an uber impressive young man that that gets what being a quarterback is all about, and the future is just really bright in that room. There's three guys right there that I think speak. Um, that, that there's a lot to be freaking excited about with that group moving forward. As you look at the NFL, what Patrick Mahomes is doing and the big time quarterbacks that are consistently winning championships around football minus JJ McCarthy. Um, <laughs> it's exciting to know what you've got in the pipeline with Tramel Jones committed in the 25 class who continues to light it up on the seven on circuit at the, with South Florida express. So yeah, quarterback for me least, um, TJ's got some nice touch, man. I like yeah. watching his film. I've man. got two for least. One of them's gonna be a, one of them's gonna be a bit hot topic, uh, hot take. For, uh, I'm gonna start with tight end though. Uh, tight end for me is one that I'm very concerned about going into the season, and why I think maybe that we're gonna see some more eleven. You've got Kyle Morlock returning. I wouldn't exactly say Kyle Morlock was great last year, but obviously he's got another year. He's got a year under his belt coming out of shorter college. He's got a year as a full-time starter. Shorter um, university. Yeah, shorter university. Apologies to that. To that. Sorry. Year, sorry. That shorter year. viewers. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> he's got a, he's got a year of development under his belt, a year of strength uh, training, uh, another off season uh, with with Josh Storms. But behind that, I mean, you've got Jackson West. Yeah, yeah you've got Jackson Thomas, West who hasn't yeah. proven to be able to stay healthy. Who I'm a, a, a huge yeah. fan of. I remember. Yeah talking about him when they landed that young man that I gave a lot of rave reviews that he was going to have an NFL career hasn't panned out yet. We'll see if that continues or if he makes another step this off season, but then you have true freshman Landon Thomas who they're high on and they want to see. I wonder if that's a spot post spring that they're looking at in the portal to just maybe bring another body in. Um, but then the other one for me that I'm worried about is defensive end still. Um, okay. I know there's, there's a lot of excitement about the, uh, Make sure I say this correctly. Sione Lolohia. Hey. Lolohia. Apologies. Hey, uh, Thank you for correcting me. No problem. Um, Friend Adura, of the Adura, islands on this program. Yeah. Adura Jai and Marvin Jones Jr. Uh, and there's a ton of excitement, and I'm excited to see them get to work. And I think that ultimately I'm going to end up being wrong about what I say right now, but there's not a lot of pass rush production there with those guys. Uh, Marvin Jones Jr. hasn't 
proven to be a guy that you can rely on as a every down defensive end, really a defensive end at all. Uh, he didn't play that at at, at Georgia. Uh, Durajai looks like a million bucks and sounds like a million bucks, but has shown to be a bit of a project still. Um, yeah. So I, you could find yourself quickly in, in a bad spot if those guys don't take the steps that they think they're going to. Ultimately, I think they will, and it will be fine. But it's just pol- reason for concern. Well, I, I think the the one to to I agree with you with there. There's a lot of question marks. They clearly didn't feel great about it. They threw bodies at the problem. But the good news is that they do have bodies, and you still have you know Byron Turner, Patrick um, Payton, Patrick Payton, mm. and if I mean if you count uh, Marvin Jones, Patrick Payton. Byron Turner, um, and and the two other transfers. Um, that, that's five guys, right? They they turn, tend to have a rotation of four guys, so you have the spring to kind of evaluate what you have, and hopefully, like you know, choose the best four, if that makes sense. You know, mm-hmm. like you've you've your numbers have allowed you to have a bust. I I, I understand Adam's concern. I think that they. Pass rushing stuff, I think, is still a question mark. I think some guys like Sione and Tommy Wah are going to look better, I think, in the pass rushing set just because of the help that they're going to have on the interior. I do think one thing, I, I think the pass rushing is still a question mark at this point because you're betting on a lot of projection. I think what's actually not a question mark is I think they're going to be really stout on the edges defending the run. So I think that, that I, I feel really confident in this this defensive line's overall ability to stop the run. I think the pass rush still is a question mark. Moving on, I'll do my least confident first. I think I kind of agree with Adam. Tight end, I like Kyle Morlock with another year of season. And uh, Jackson West showed a couple of flashes last year. Landon Thomas is a true freshman, albeit a very talented one. If we run as much two tight end set as we did last year with that same crew, I think it could give us a it could give us some issues in my opinion. Yeah, they're the, probably going to. <laughs> Yeah. If I'm going to be totally honest. Just I don't. I don't just, think they're going to go away from two tight ends anytime just let soon. Just put it out in the air. Spread them out. One tight end, please. Multiple back set. I don't know. Either way, the group that I'm most confident in, and honestly, I feel like you could say this every year in a Mike Norvell offense. Yep. I'm most confident in the running backs, even with losing like a Trey Benson. I am confident in what Mike Norvell and David Johnson can do coaching. I am very high on this is Roydell Williams, the Alabama transfer. I think to me, he looked like a, just like a supercharged Trayshawn Ward. I love his decisiveness. That one cut ability hit the hole with the bigger guys on the offensive line. I think this kid is going to have a great, he's going to have a breakout season. We know what Lawrence Toa Feely can do. Just look at this dude. Very good receiving threat. Just, I, I like the way that this kid runs. Alabama wanted to keep him, I think, desperately, and they did not. <sighs> He's just going to be a nice compliment to what Mike likes to do. I think Keziah Holmes is another sure, reliable, talented running back, and we know the explosion of Lawrence Toafili. Then you start working in, like maybe a guy like a Sam Singleton, Cam Davis, the the eighteen going on like like a yoked <laughs> like thirty year old <laughs> like. <laughs> it's it's an exciting room, man. Coached by what arguably one of the best like running game centric head coaches in the game right now with some real deal talent. Like he just took a kid that everybody was absolutely pissed at him for taking at Oregon. Trey Benson damaged goods, not a high, not a high draft, like not a high high school prospect at all, and has turned him into an NFL draft pick, man. Now, what's he going to do when he gets his hands on some talent like this? Like, th- yeah, like, dude, look at that, man. Like, this is, I, I got no question that we're going to have a productive backfield next year. I'm supremely I confident. I think it's very fair, fair. Yeah. And I, I think you're kind of backing up this running back with, with what might be a better offensive line. Um, time will tell with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and with with a quarterback that I think complements kind of where you're building the offensive line towards, you know, we're talking about bigger bodied offensive line and we've got a bigger bodied quarterback to kind of complement these guys. You're going to have a powerful run game. And, um, you know, I, I think the most important thing is that DJ is going to be able to 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 really stretch the field vertically. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something we'll talk about, I guess, as time goes on. Yeah, that's going to change 
that's going to change numbers in the box, which is only going to help these running backs. So, yeah. Totally agree. Speaking of DJ, next question, I believe it is from Matt with one T, 329. How might the offense differ from last year with DJU at quarterback? How's it going to differ? Um, I think first off, you're going to see, you are going to see a more willing runner at quarterback. You will see more short yarded stuff. I think you'll see QB power. I think you'll see QB counter. You'll see a more willing keeper on like zone read stuff. And I ultimately think that you're going to see, I mean, obviously you're going to see vertical throws. You're going to see different vertical throws. He's got a, this guy has a Jordan and DJ skill set is different, but I think you're going to see, a more effective deep ball. There's going to be some stuff that Jordan did that DJ can't do and isn't as good at. I do. will. I will be interested to see what the turnover numbers look like. He cleaned them up at Oregon state. I would like to see him. I don't want to see that be consistent. And I think that you're going to see the middle of the field utilized more in the passing game. What do you guys think? Yeah, I I think that um, we're we're definitely going to go more into this as, as time goes on. Mm -hmm. Oh Um, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they do a lot more under center stuff. If the offense end up looking more like kind of what Oregon state was last year, lots of under center, lots of play action, trying to set up D shots, seeing a lot more deep crossing routes instead of, you know, outside verticals. Um, And, you know, with all the, you are losing explosiveness in the run game. You are losing a consistency on, on short to intermediate routes that Jordan Travis was giving you. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so you've got to lean into the strengths, right? How do I get DJ to, to show his strengths, use play action, use these longer developing plays, allow these speed receivers to get downfield. Um, and a lot of that has to do with going under center. A lot of that has to do with, um, being successful in the run game. A lot of that has to do with, um, trusting your offensive line to, to give them time. And, and hopefully you can use his strengths to your advantage. What do you think, Adam? I think based on some of the some of what we've said already, like we think that maybe there's going to be some more duo run game involved. I think you're going to see them be more pistol based, yeah, as opposed to under center. Um, I just think that makes sense. Mike's never been a guy that's going under center. Well, at least this time of course, he's not going under center a lot. They've gone under center some. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've. I've, seen DJ operate out of pistol at Clemson some, if I recall correctly. And he did at Oregon state too. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's always been comfortable. It allows him to work that downhill run game and also play action. I mean, that's one of the biggest things that people, they started running the pistol was all about the play action, hiding the back. So um, it would, it, that would make some sense to me. I agree. It's we're going to see more, maybe more deep crossers, I really do believe we're going to see more 11 personnel out of them. It doesn't make sense that they went from being a team that basically had eight tight ends on the roster to now like three or four. Um, It just, I don't know. It's perplexing to me that what they've done at the tight end room uh, position um, with the numbers, just the numbers alone, what they're going into this season uh, uh, with. Um, So I think, I think it makes a little bit more sense that they're going to maybe run a little bit more 11, but, it's not going to shock me if they're running 13 on the first play. Okay. I, I think we've gotten to a point where I, we need to define those terms. I'm not sure if everybody. Okay, 12 personnel is one, one. 12 personnel is one running back and two tight ends. 11 is one tight end or one running back and one tight end yep. with, with three wide receivers. Um, so the, the big number that changes mostly is the second one, right? How yeah. many tight ends are on the field? One, so two, we're two. saying they run a lot of 12. The, the, the argument is that they'll probably run more eleven this year. Yeah. So, so more one yeah. one running back, one tight end with with three wide receiver types. I, I'm curious. You know, you go out and get a guy like Jalen Lucas, um, Ja'Kai Douglas's brother out of Indiana, return specialist. He's going to be a running back, I guess, but he's probably going to play more wide wide out. It just, I'm curious if we're going to maybe start to see some more jet type of stuff built into the offense, some more movement based run game, uh, trickeration. Um, I don't know. I'm ex- I am very excited for spring to get here 
So we start getting some of these answers. Dude, you could have a little, you could have a little Miami Dolphins flavor, right? Big, <laughs> big armed son of a gun from the island, surrounded by speed at the slot, not necessarily elite size, even though you do have some guys like Kentron and Malik. Mm-hmm. I it would it would be nice, man. There's a lot of interesting stuff, and Mike is if there's one thing that Mike Norvell is, I think that he's very flexible and adaptable. I cannot wait to see what the old mad scientist is tinkering around for his offense in 2024. Moving to, on. Oh, go wait, ahead. before we move too far, um, oh, I do have, it. have numbers on this. Florida state was ran plays with two tight ends or more 43% of the time, 44, 43.6% of the time, which is good for 16th in the country. Yeah. Um, Felt like it. So, tons of tons of 12 personnel that's what they base out of that's not like typical most teams in the modern era are going to be out of 11 personnel um so yeah that's that's something that's something that's huge that will dramatically change how this offense works going into next year yeah. if they do it all right moving on <laughs> yeah. j rod 31 who who do you think makes a big jump from 2023 to 2024 any Our names of who the hard hitting questions. Yeah, what do you what do you guys think? Any names that really jump off the page? I had a couple that jumped <laughs> off for me, but what about you guys? Uh, Destin Hill, I think, is going to make a big jump this year. That's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, I, I think he was primed to have a bigger second half of the year last year than than what he obviously did, but the injury took that away from him. I'm hoping Hakeem is healthy because it'd be very valuable if he. You know, obviously he's only a sophomore. He lost quite a bit of uh, of time, but they were. I mean, he came in in the Duke game in a vital third down situation, and they went to him. Yeah, that clutch catch. Volumes. Yeah, that speaks volumes for what they think about him and where he was. Um, it wouldn't shock me, as probably the most talented player in that room still, if he made a big jump. Um, but I think I think Dustin's where my head's probably at. Wouldn't you know, I think you can expect a leap from Kyle Morlock. Um and then on the defensive side of the ball. Oof. I think AZ is gonna be I mean, he already made a yeah. leap last year. This isn't like going out on a limb, but I think he's gonna be special this year. Yeah, I'm with you, man. Kev, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the Kyle Morlock thing because I, th- I think we have disparaged the tight end room, and I think that's fair based off of you're losing Jaheim Bell, you know, and you're you got some new faces. You're kind of thinned out that room a little bit. I was pretty critical of Kyle Morlock coming in, and a lot of that had nothing to do with me thinking he wasn't a talented guy. It was more just he's coming from a D2 place they're asking him to learn a lot and have to grow a lot especially as an inline blocker and we saw a lot of struggles with that um last season where you know that they'd have him as as the counter blocker and he would just struggle to to kind of get that you know kick block down but i think they're going to have an off season with him i think he clearly has the talent to be a really good tight end but i i just didn't think he'd be able to turn that on in a year and so now You've got another off season. I think they'll probably put on a little bit of weight. Um, and I, I think he's going to be a better all around tight end for you. And I, I think he's going to go from someone that I, I think was kind of, you know, an average tight end to someone who's going to be an asset for you on the offensive side of the ball. And I think that's going to be a huge progression for him. I think so too. He, he, his, his trend line was up. I thought he started having much better games towards the end of the season, which I think is very um, encouraging. The guys that I was thinking on first on uh, Kentron, the king of the spring. And of course, a lot of this is health dependent. That kid with a lot of the guys that they have, the Ja'Kai Douglases, the Jalen Lucases, the dudes that they brought in like Destin Hill, um, Malik Benson's a guy that we think is going to play on the outside. Florida State, this, you feel pretty good about what they have at the slot position. I think Kentron can have a great year as an outside receiver mm-hmm. kev i know we have some film he did even with a limited you know his his usage being limited due to health then of course like johnny and keon taking up so many targets this kid has a legitimate skill set this kid makes impressive catches this one unfortunately didn't count but i think you're going to remember this one like that that's usable if he i think he will put it together and i think he is going to have a very nice year 
and maybe another. Maybe he'll go back to back King of the Springs. I have no idea. But Kentron is somebody that I'm excited to watch, and I think he's going to make a leap. He's the one offensive player outside of Brock Glenn, though, that also went out and made a statement against Georgia early in that game. Where Correct. He, that's a good point. Yeah, that's he, absolutely he, right. He, I think he was trying to make a point that, hey, don't forget about me now. And I did not. Uh, and the other guy on defense, and I think this is a guy that I think a ton of talent. We saw flashes, and we saw the flashes. They were really fun. Conrad Hussey. This is a guy that you need to take that next step, and I think he is. I just – the way he got thrown in, I think it was a nice developmental year for him. He got some very high leverage reps, and we pointed out on film review, sometimes they were great, and sometimes they were spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> like, more of that. And he's got it in him, man. I feel pretty confident. Like, this, just doing that consistently, seeing more plays as the game slows down for him, I, I think I, – I think he's going to be a name that we talk about a lot positively on our film reviews. What do you guys think? Yeah. And, and for everybody that is worried about him, he hasn't signed with the battle's end because I've seen it. It's a huge thing all over the message. Board. Oh, I didn't see that. So I did. I'm not yeah, putting this in my video as like a troll. <laughs> That's a huge thing about him. His deal is up in the summertime. And I believe that is when they can announce new deals and whatnot. With, hey, go with, get in there on the run game 12. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I didn't mean I to work anybody up. <laughs> I think Hussey's a good a good player to have on this list. I think he's got to continue to mature. Uh, or Yeah, he, he's got to continue to grow maturity-wise. Um, there were some talks about he you know, is a guy that can get down on himself and, and, and maybe pout a little bit when things aren't going his way. I think we'll continue to see, you know, you know, Young man got away from home. Um, you know, those guys tend to grow up a little bit from year one to year two. I'm excited about what his potential is at, at, in the safety position or in the safety room at, at, for next year. I think he's yeah, going to take a nice jump. It seemed like he was almost had a false confidence early. Like he played really hard very early. Mm -hmm. um, at that Virginia Tech game pretty early in the season, some of his first snaps. And then I think he got burned once or twice. Um, yeah. And then I think he, you could see kind of he got in his head. That decisiveness you see when he blows up that little flare screen on that first play uh, that Trey so expertly set up. Um, we, you just didn't see that in the back half of the season. I don't, and it's not because it's not there. It's not because it's disappeared. It's because mm -hmm. I think he just didn't – like he, he came in late if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a St. Yeah. Thomas kid, so they yeah, don't. They, they don't. They don't roll early. Right, so he did. He didn't have the comfortability with the the system to lean back on when he started doubting himself. And at the end of the day, your safety, your job is to not let people score touchdowns. And yeah. so, like, I think he kind of went conservative instead of uh, maintaining that aggressiveness as someone who was still learning the ropes. And hopefully, that's something he can kind of grow into and know when to be aggressive, when to be conservative remember they played him against bc they got him on a trick play they didn't put him back in and we didn't see him for like three weeks and yeah. then mike was talking about it in i can't remember if it was like a bye week or at some point during a, a pre and a weekly presser he basically mm -hmm. said like we we made a mistake doing that we've got to get him back in there and they worked him back in he was part of the rotation in some of the some of those games that they were beaten up on teams, but when the games were tighter or bigger games, they narrowed those rotations down a little bit and he got less plays, but he still played. Yeah. I think, I think all the factors are there where I think it's going to make a nice leap. All that stuff you said, yeah. get the more reps game slows down. The athletic talent is a hundred percent there. Moving been. on. What is this? Darlin Knight? Darlin, Darlin Knight 27. Nice Darlin. doggo picture right there. Cute pup. Any chance that they teach it? Oh, okay. It's a little shady. I would ask that. Uh, yeah. They teach a QB to consistently keep the ball and run it off, handoff, run, I'm guessing, zone read options. Or is the spirit of DeAndre Francois still haunting us? Well, we've got some... We've got some... We've got some film to back that up, but I, I think... I think, yeah. I think... I think DJ is a more willing runner, specifically short yardage situations, specifically goal line. Like I think he's a legitimate weapon to help you make a lot of those third and twos, third and ones, a lot less arduous than they've been for such a for such a 
an offense that has been pretty good at scoring points. That short yardage stuff has been rough the couple of years. Well, more importantly, they're going to be more willing to run DJ. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't all on Jordan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like let's what they list Jordan at two fifteen. I mean, that's really generous, probably. I mean, probably. Probably, <laughs> probably two hundred pounds, and I mean, they when he takes shots, he takes shots, and you just couldn't afford to lose him. Um, you're in a little better position. Not that they want to lose DJ, but they're in a little better position with Brock as a backup as opposed to Tate being sorry, Kev. Tate being the backup. Um it, it just yeah, I, I think you're just gonna be more willing to run DJ as opposed to Kev's trying to find some stats. This one enraged him. <laughs> this question, Silent rage. This question, this question definitely made him mad. I'm with you. Okay. It's- yeah, sorry. Oh, you guys finish. Oh, he is looking up. He's the stat yeah, bomb. He definitely, he definitely is. He definitely is. I, I'm with you, dude. They're gonna. It complements a- DJ. He's got the he's got the durability, and it's it's a nice to have, dude. You're an Eagles fan. How cool is it to have that automatic third down, like third and short pickup? It's a concerted effort by the staff to not run Jordan. There were times where Jordan didn't take off on on passing plays where he could have taken off. But that's him trying to develop as a thrower and thinking that he can make throws. Um, those, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't, it's not a concern for me. Um, okay, uh, I'm, I want to start this conversation. Show us some stats that probably don't. And I got some. Film, no, no, no. I got some film too of DJ keeping the ball on his own read. Okay, that's that stuff. what I. That's what I want to show first, right? right. So, um, so. Trey, Trey found a nice clip. It's it's going to illustrate what we need to show. Really exotic stuff here. All right, so it's it's at three fifty five. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get us there. All right. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you pulled up. All right, I don't think this is the play you wanted, or maybe I'm on the wrong highlight film. Um, okay, so let's let's define what as a read option is and what it's not right. So people okay. get RPOs confused with read options all the time, all the time. It's a huge confusion point. I get it. They both kind of sprung up and, you know, around a similar time. Read options are a little bit older of a concept. All right. All right. I need to actually remove this. Um, but this is a read option. What happens is he is reading this defensive end, right? Since he crashes to take the running back, he's allowed to pull it and run it himself, right? That is a read option. Um, that It is a choice between either the running back running the ball or the quarterback running the ball. An RPO would be something similar. Usually, you're instead of reading an end or, or a guy in the line of scrimmage, you're reading someone kind of in the secondary, a linebacker, um, and it would be the difference between you giving this ball and you like throwing it on a, on a little screen or a slant, right? Mm-hmm. That's run pass option, right? So that's the difference here. He correctly reads this read option, right? This guy crashes, uh, you know, NC state's ready for it. They've got some guy to replace him. This is very, very typical, right? You've, they, people know how to stop the read option. You have someone crash and someone replace, uh, DJ wins here. Right, he gets the yard. So, I totally agree with you guys that he will be used more on designed quarterback runs. Yeah, I think so. Whether or not read options are going to dramatically change and like you're going to see him pulling a lot of running plays, I don't think that will happen. And I have a lot of stats that back that up. Yeah, I think they'll be more designed. I think we saw. I don't think that that's the way that the question is being they, asked in fairness multiple questions have asked about read options in particular i know but i think that you're i think you're taking it very literally and i think that they very much just mean are we going to run the damn quarterback we're yeah. going to i believe we will run the quarterback more yes there's a lot uh, there are a lot of folks out there that believe the only way to run the quarterback is on a zone read option uh, play, yes but tell awesome. us why that's wrong kevin there's also a lot of people that believe that every time you hand off the ball to the running back, yeah, that there's a read attached. To there's it a read time. attached to it, or he should pull the ball or yeah. whatever. Right. Like if the run play gets blown up in the front side, he should have pulled the ball. Or if they see a defensive end 
bite, he should have pulled the ball. That's yeah. not always open. Yeah. It's not always the right move. Nope. Um, the most DJ Uyangale's ever pulled the ball on a read option. So if I'm answering this question literally, is 27 times in a season, and that was in 2022. That was on 251 attempts, which means about one out of every 10 times he pulled the ball. That's his highest rate. Last year, Jordan Travis pulled the ball 20 times on read options, which is a pretty decent amount. Um, and that was mm-hmm. on, let me see, 164 attempts. So a lot less over, yeah. over that 10% mark. So like... They didn't not pull it an abnormal amount of times. Like going through the film, there was a whole film where I got kind of fed up with this question and I just got kind of sassy and I was like, this is another read option you that never. wasn't a pull. Um, not uh, the, the, the read option, pulling the read option isn't always the answer. Like that's, it's not like some magical, magical fix yeah, to the elixir, run game. Yeah. So. But I, th- th- if the heart of the question is, I think DJ Uyangale, while is a less explosive runner than Jordan Travis, will be a more useful runner on a down to down basis. Yeah. So I think maybe the next phase of this question that the conversation needs to turn towards is like, what ways are they going to use DJ as a runner that they didn't with Jordan? But we might it's, see. It's, yeah. We, we might see more. We saw it in 21 maybe where they ran a lot of midline option. Yeah. We may see the return of that, which there will be a pool component to uh, that play. Um, We are probably going to see some more quarterback power. Yes. Uh, It would make sense that we see a little more quarterback power. It would make some sense that we see DJ potentially keep the ball on some of those toss read plays that we have seen out of them um, where they keep it with the, they have the quarterback option on the uh, quarterback counter on the backside of that play would make some sense. And we see some of that from them. Um, I'm trying to think of what else, maybe some quarterback dart stuff. Um, they'll spread them out and run QB draw. I think you'll see that they did that yeah. at Oregon state with some of that. They'll yeah, run, I think they'll run state. quarterback counter. Yeah. I think yeah. they're going to run quarterback counter. Yeah, like, I, I think I, you're going to see a variety of him use, but to Kev and Adam's point, it's going to be because the coach's design and it's an yeah. active choice to activate the running back, to activate the quarterback in the running game more, which I think to Kev's point is a choice that they clearly did not want Jordan to make. I think from what they called now, the scramble stuff we'll see. I want to be interested to see how DJ is in the scrambled in the scramble mode. Will he take it off and try to get like an easy eight or nine? I'm guessing. I don't know. I think he's probably going to try to go for the bomb too, because that's in his skill set, just like it was with Jordan. So I don't know if we're going to see inherently more scrambles out of DJ. I think it's going to be with the big difference is the designed quarterback runs. Mm-hmm. I think that we can hit, sit at about an hour, guys. I think let's just go through some of the questions. Yeah, like let's just go through that it. thread and just see what maybe isn't any film pulled up. Pull it up here. Uh, all right, I'm going to go to the top. All right, we answered energy with the uh, cheese, not specific. Are we going to break down Glenn against UGA? Probably at some point. But I don't yeah. know. I, I don't want to no, see we'll that watch again. Watch that again. If you guys want it? Yeah. Uh, if you want, if you want to see us break that down, break down block Brock Glenn against uh, Georgia. Uh, comment in the comment section and let us know because I don't really want to, but. We will if that's what you guys want. We aim to please. We work for you, the people. Do mailbags exist in real life anymore? Does anybody know that answer? I bet that I, I, I'm going to guess yes. There is somewhere in this world with a big old fat sack of mail. <laughs> uh, Osceola 239. God, legal. The MTD and the ACC case. When do you think we'll see resolution for an outcome? Motion to dismiss. I think yes. And what ultimately, what do you think happens? Settlement, trial, etc. I am no expert. <laughs> I've seen uh, my wife and I just started watching Suits, and I'm like 12 Ooh, episodes. Trey in. is an expert. He's, he's a legal so expert. I'm gonna say settle. Just I settle. Settlement settle. Makes settle. The most sense. You don't want discovery. 
You don't want Florida State's Leon County Harvey Specter digging through your books. That's a bad situation for anybody. There will be a settlement, and Florida State will be playing in a different football conference in 25. 25. Wow. Yeah, I that's, think, that'd be I, fast. I tend to agree. I think it gets settled. I don't think I don't think anybody wants this going to court. I don't think it's good for anybody involved, especially not in the ACC. Yeah. Um, no. And ultimately, I think that they know that the time is coming to a very quick close with the Big Ten and the SEC meeting, having their own whole shebang, and yep. uh, the uh, college football playoff just announced some massive deal with ESPN today or yesterday, whatever day it was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the writing's on the wall for the ACC. They're going to see it coming, and they're going to yeah, this thing's going to get dealt with here sooner rather than later. But I. Promise you, I have no freaking clue, <laughs> and I do know I do have a friend that's a Florida State lawyer, and I won't shout him out because I wouldn't dare want to do that and get anybody in trouble. But um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, you two numbskulls made a comment. Yeah, newcomer, new question. New, we we J Rod had this newcomer. You're looking forward to watch the most. You have a favorite uh, newcomer. <sighs> All right. For me, like, obviously, you know, my answer. So my non Polynesian newcomer that I'm excited to watch the most is Malik Benson. Mm. I want to, I'm interested. I really want to watch Malik Benson. Sheboygan. Kev go. Earl Little. I want to see, I want to see how he slots in. I think he's going to be pretty darn good. Yeah. Hmm. Favorite newcomer. I'm going to say Cam Davis. Fun. All right. uh, favorite legal buddy. podcasters. We are the walk with papuchas. We are his favorite legal <laughs> podcasters. How would you I don't know what that on FSU's recent motions to dismiss? Uh, yeah, they're great. But great vibes vibe. are dope, bro. Vibes yeah. are sick. Right. No cap, not sus. <coughs> Solid vibe, question. vibing hard. How many miles would you walk with papuchas for a national championship in 2024? I would walk across the freaking country with them. Yep. We might actually get AB down to Tallahassee. I think he'd walk that far. I would For walk a guaranteed national championship, yeah. I would walk 500 miles. Only if John Papuchas walked with me, though. So, JP, you want a natty, baby. Let's get them walking shoes. <laughs> Hell yeah, Tzatziki John. Uh, Saf28 misunderstood the thread tell and thought you wanted us to send in videos. I guess I invited my stepmom over for no reason. All right, sir. Cool, bro. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, Toxic Knoll. How would Coach AB and Kevin Little improve the offense and defense last year? I don't want to go too deep into this. Maybe this will become a separate video of its own. Um, I think the first thing they need to do is run more 11 and more motion on offense. And defensively, I don't think they need to do a whole lot different. Their defense looked real good last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the personnel on roster, how would you both run things schematically to use utilize the skill set? Kind of said that more. Yeah, I think we tackled that question already. 11. Yeah. Do you legitimately think Brock has a chance to beat out DJU and why? No, I don't. I no, I don't. I, he's a starter. I, no. For what you want this year, I uh, I think if that happens, something's gone wrong, or Brock Glenn has just. It's a win win. <laughs> if, if he wins the job, I think it means. Maybe He's you're for real because you know what you got with DJ. Yeah, maybe your ceiling for this year has been accelerated. Uh, at Trey Roland, who is the greatest wrestler of all time, and why is it Macho Man Randy Savage? I love Macho Man Randy Savage, so I think the greatest is tough. Yeah. I never mm -hmm. like to do. I never like to do the greatest, right? Because I always look at it a multitude of factors. If he says Jerry match Jones. quality, promo quality. Quality of character, and I give you bonus points if you were able to be truly effective as both a face, a good guy, and to heal a bad guy. So there's plenty of – I'd say maybe like the objectively greatest – I, I tend to lean, lean towards like Stone Cold Steve Austin. His oh, run at the top wasn't yeah. as long as yeah. some of the other guys that you could say, but he's he's that perfect – He's that perfect blend to me, except as a heel, I didn't think he was good in WCW as a heel, but on the top, not as much. So I always like to answer this question. I like to be a big pussy and like pivot and do my favorite wrestlers, like my, my, just my personal favorite, not the greatest objectively, but my favorite. And my favorites are la, Chris Jericho, la, 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 la. Mick Foley. Oh, yeah. 
uh, Macho Man. I love Macho Man. I think that like it, for all those factors that I said, like of like who the greatest should be, he's underrated. Um, Macho Man, and then a new a newer guy. I, I'm a huge Kenny Omega freak. I love Kenny Omega. I love New Japan Pro Wrestling. Kenny Omega. His trilogy with Okada is the best the peak of what pro wrestling should be and then my mount rushmore stupid i put five and then bret hart i love bret hart that's fair that's fair big bret big bret hart fan myself everything Uh, that he does was just crisp dude from and you know what stuff that he does like nobody does a side russian leg sweep anymore and they shouldn't because bret hart retired that's a great underutilized move his stuff was crisp it was beautiful Thank you for this question. Stone, Stone, Stone Cold is my all-time favorite. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Um, used to love Jimmy Snuka. I remember all, I, <laughs> I remember – well, I shouldn't say – I'm not going to tell that story, but um, – oh, oh, Ste- you got an X-rated Ricky. Jimmy Snuka story. No, 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 no. It's about uh, an old blockbuster and all the WrestleMania uh, VHS tapes. And, yeah, it's a wild scene, but uh, – Got you, buddy. Ricky Steamboat was great. Loved, loved – uh, Love the American dream. I'm I Trey is not. We've had this conversation off air. I'm very excited about this the the rock and Roman Reigns, this whole WrestleMania storyline. I'm not gonna get into it because I'm gonna piss him off. But he already pissed me off talking about Chris Jericho who was a turd. So oh come on, man. Let's not go there. Let's let's we don't let's keep let's keep the vibes good for the people. That's what they want. Uh, We can argue about this later. D Pierre 573. Do you think Edwin Joseph will get lost in the roster? Hey, he was he was kind of dinged up last year, I believe, and, and a true freshman. Yeah, I don't. I think he's uber talented. I think he's a guy that's going to be in that nickel spot this upcoming season, and we'll see what he's got. I mean, yeah, he's got a, he's got a chance to beat out greedy and kind of step in that role as as a yeah. rotational guy, and you know. Yeah, I think we'll see him. I, I think I think he will be in the nickel. I think he will be in the nickel rotation, and I think that he's got the talent to make a nice impact. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. Uh, Beta Knowles, this is mainly for for me as a fellow Philadelphia Eagles fan. What the f happened to them this year? Very short synopsis. Lost all confidence. Very, very, very horrible offensive scheme. Made a horrific change in play caller at defensive coordinator and that moron decided to run his own thing that completely was against what they were already running um britain britain covey had a great quote about it recently look it up uh, he, he said a lot of really smart stuff if you hear if you had free sovereignty to punch one i'm not oh. in the face uh, uh no 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 what i'm punching somebody in the face I mean, listen, I've got a list. Mario I have Bristol. a list. I just didn't really want to say it out loud. Listen, Boo Corgan, these <laughs> hands. Line up <laughs> all them game day hoes that's, in a that's line. Fair. That's fair. With, with full sovereignty, I'm knocking that's out 75% of the ESPN roster, bro. We're throwing <laughs> hands on them all. CFP, ESPN. I've been wanting to punch Tim Tebow in the face since 2008. <laughs> like I've been wanting to punch him forever. I don't care how many well, kids he circumcises. I hate his guts for what he did to me in college. I was right. in college during the peak of the Tebow mania. Terrible. A lot of people I'd punch if I had full sovereignty. Keep going. None of those people made my list. It's interesting. Right. Who do you want? Who's your most Who's your most punchy guy that you want uh, to punch the most? Who's punchy? I think it'd be fun to like punch Paul Feinbaum and watch his body decompose into dust. <laughs> I just don't think Paul Feinbaum's worth the effort of punching. Uh, it is for me. I think it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'll punch him right in his damn face. I think that'd be sick. He's just such a. All right. Jokey, one, two, three, four, five. Who benches the most? Probably Trey. Have you seen this dude with his shirt? Yeah, look at him. No, 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 no. I'd say it's still you, Adam, that offensive line. Kev is. I don't know why people – maybe it's because you're a chemist, Kev, and you're articulate, yeah. but people think you're a puss, and I think you could probably throw up some iron. Throw up some yeah, iron. yeah, I'm more of an Olympic guy. Um, I'm not doing a lot of benching these days. It's not, yeah. not where I'm at in my life anymore. But If we, if we want to talk Ooh, about who hi. snatches the most, so that's probably oh. me. Oh, I bet, right. you, I bet you do, you <laughs> hound. All right. Uh, we're talk about the blitzing <laughs> with the new personnel. Do you expect more three wide, rece- wide receiver sets from Chris 
crispy more. Uh, hope so. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, Hope. hopefully there, I'm hopeful that there's maybe going to be a little bit more 11. Not that there's anything wrong with 12. It's where the foot, it's where the game is trending towards. Um, I don't know if this roster for this year is built for it. So we'll see. And if so, how does that, if this affect both the passing game and the running game, uh, passing game wise, I mean, I think it opens some things up, but I don't, I don't know if if eleven and twelve necessarily change your passing game, run game it it changes some stuff. Um, if you're running more eleven, you're probably not running. You may not be running quite as much duo. Um, I don't know. It depends on how they want to get into it. I mean, you can run all you can run all that stuff from eleven or twelve. Right. I, yeah. It's, it's it's just presentation. I just um, to to me it would be like whatever the formation. I just want to see more space utilized. I thought that the team looked, and I'll say it, I'll take it to the grave. Florida State was more effective in all facets of the game. I thought on offense last year when they spread the defense out. I'd like to yeah. just see that. However they do yeah. that, cool. What? Do it a little bit more. I think that I think there was part of that that was a product of you had big your two wide receivers you had to have on the field were bigger bodied. Yeah. So like they're. Right now, you might be able to. What you get with fast receivers is you can have these compressed formations and still spread the field vertically, right? By getting these guys deep, getting them Fair. across the field. And so maybe that's what they're looking at more. Um, I mean, they, it's, they've kind of built a more modern passing attack, like build wise, six foot. 195, 200, 205 pound wide receivers that can really run and run routes, um, as opposed to the six seven, six four Keon and Johnny, which were great, but I don't know, one trick. They're not one trick ponies, but they're they're kind of they were kind of pigeonholed into a box of what they did, as opposed to what you get with some of these maybe a little bit smaller but shiftier guys. I agree. All right, let's hit up two more yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. And then I think uh, let's go to Think covered. Man. Any any depth chart hot takes, guys? You think will emerge and shock some people? Mm, we talked about the emergence. I honestly think, for whatever reason, I think uh, I don't know why it would shock somebody. I think Richie Leonard's going to be your starting left guard. I think for, I, I like I liked watching his film. I like the way he played. Nobody's penciling him in to me. I have him penciled in in my head depth chart, and I think that he's going to be a good, a nice, good piece that you're going to add. I guess that'd be a hot take, but I don't, I got to see these guys on the field first, I think. Yeah. Uh, hot takes. Like somebody that's going to beat somebody out that you wouldn't think. No. Yeah. yeah I don't know. I don't know. Omar Graham's going to be better than people think. Yeah. I think that might be my hot take for. For the for the depth chart necessary or whatever, but yeah. Uh, other than that, I mean, nothing like nothing like makes me want to say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to plant my flag there." Um, the offensive line, I mean, Julian Armel is not going to play. Uh, you know, I I, I don't. That's know. your hot take. No, I don't know. I'm like, I you know, I, I that, that's one people I think are looking like Julian Armel is going to take somebody's job. I don't know if I buy that. Um, I think Jalen Early maybe is a guy that would would take somebody's job before Julian would, but yeah, who knows? I mean, it's, it's tough to say at this point. I don't, I don't have a lot of hot takes on the depth chart. I don't think we'll have to see in spring how everybody kind of yeah, starts matching up against. I that. think we're too. I think we're too early in the process to have hot takes. I think it would be interesting. The one thing that could end up being like a hot take is if somebody comes and takes like an established guy's like starting mm -hmm. spot. If like an Earl Little comes in. And he takes he takes over the starting nickel from like a greedy Vance, or if like a Jalen Early does come into the lineup and he takes snaps away from maybe one of the like a Keandre or Darius or something like that. Yeah, or some or or God, I think the biggest one would be like if Darius well like what is Mo Smith's spot at center? Like they keep they they brought in competition over the past years. Mo always continues to survive. Would this be right. the offseason where he's not the starting center? At this point, I'm not I'm not projecting any of those things, <laughs> but I think something that would be interesting, like is if a newer guy, whether it's a younger dude that's already on the roster or a transfer guy, 
or a true freshman comes in and takes an established starter's spot. Mm-hmm. I don't, I can't think of too many times where we've seen that. Yeah. All right. Uh, last, last one here. Uh, and some of these are going to get turned into their own videos. So, uh, saved by I am story from each of the guys on how, why they became an FSU fan. I guess mine's going to be the only one that's actually interesting because guys are both there. So, or were. Well, go ahead. Let's see how damn interesting it is, then, man. You can <laughs> I mean, it's not our story. It's, yeah. no, it's, well, it, it's not that interesting. I mean, I, it was like 1987 or 88. Um, I just remember watching Florida State Miami on TV, and it was really like the first time I'd ever sat down um, and watched. So I was four or five, uh, maybe, maybe six. Um, it was the first time I ever like sat down and watched college football, even. And mm-hmm. it was that game. It was that game. I can remember vividly, um, and just seeing the colors and how incredible the pageantry was, and the game was really good. And like, I can't tell you anything about the game itself. I can just remember vividly seeing it, and uh, I just fell in love. Went went nuts. And then obviously they were good. So it was one of those things as a kid. You're like, okay, yeah, they're good. Um, I'm loving what I'm seeing right here, right now. Just kind of started watching them over the years. I mean, I, I remember staying up. I mean, I remember watching them in 93. I watched them when they lost to Notre Dame. Um, yeah, I just, just one of those deals. Just kind of fell in love, saw it, fell in love with it, and never looked back. Florida State is a team that's fun because they have a – like I, I know living up here in Iowa now, I'm originally from Florida. It, it's a team that had a connection to like a group of people from like a certain like generation, like people yeah. around our age, like my boss has no connection whatsoever. Born and bred Iowa dude had a Florida state starter jacket. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, and it's the one that you're thinking of mm-hmm. the one that everybody had, yeah. but like, it was cool to be an FSU fan. See, I, I run into FSU fans up here for me. Like, like you said, it's actually not anything too exotic. The only thing that's interesting is my entire family is UF. Every single person on my mom's side, every single male went to University of Florida and they went to the same, they were in the same fraternity at University of Florida. The only person that was a Florida State fan was my dad. He was the only person that I watched college football with. So I was. I, they took me to the swamp as a kid all the time to try to like convert me. It never happened. I stuck with my dad when it came time for colleges. I was forced by my grandmother, God rest her soul, sweetest woman in the entire world, a literal angel on earth. She goes, you will apply for the university of Florida. I applied for both. I got into both. I, one of the toughest days I've ever had talking to my grandma is when I told her that I was going to go to Florida state, despite being accepted by the university of Florida. The only, the worst part is when I told her, like I got this tattoo, she was very mad. The university of Florida thinks she was mad at more. She told me no, like straight up. She you're ruining your life. You're going to burn bridges. And she wanted me to write a letter of apology to the university of Florida for not accepting their offer of admittance. I was like, grandma, like 30,000 people apply to the school like every single day. They don't care. Like, I promise you, they don't care. She goes, you need to do it now. She didn't talk to me for like a couple months. (laughs) And having your grandma pissed off at you solely due to your college football fan affiliation was tough. It was a sacrifice that I needed to make. Luckily, grandma and I. We ended on great terms because she's like the best woman that's ever walked this earth. She's just a sweet <laughs> angel. But yeah, man, I did, had to deal with some stuff, but it's always been Knowles through and through. And Kev, I guess, you- I guess my story. Yeah, uh, I was born into it. You know, I uh, my middle name is actually Nolan, N-O-L-E-N, um, instead of the traditional no. N-O-L-A-N. Is it really? Yeah, so I was, I was named after sweet. Florida State in a, in a kind of roundabout way. Um Grew up in Atlanta where yeah, I had friends that were Florida fans. Like we had a little friend group, a Florida fan, Georgia Tech fan, Georgia fan, um, a bandwagon fan that liked, you know, TCU or Oregon, depending on the year. Um, <laughs> a cool uniform fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, uh, so like every weekend we would come back and clown each other. And unfortunately, this was during, you know, the, you know, from the, the years of like 2006, 2009, 10, and like Florida State was very rarely on the top of the the, the those matchups. So, um, 
but it kind of solidified me. My uh, my PE teacher called me criminal. Um, so so good. At, so at so time, those so. puns are always so creative still. <laughs> yeah. So I was I was like the only Florida State fan that I kind of knew growing up, besides my family. So it kind of like insulated me as like I ha- like this is my identity, you know, kind of deal. And so, <laughs> yeah, dude. You know, it was part of my name. So it kind of just became. It was just it was fate that I would end up here, even though I didn't go to undergrad here. I love it, dude. From the womb, Kev always been <laughs> representing. I respect that. And we we had a talk, man. Those early two thousands teams, like those were my formative teams, like growing up. Like I have an unhealthy love for like Greg Jones and all those guys. But anyway, the only thing I have more of an unhealthy love for than Florida State and Greg Jones is you, our viewers, because I love you so much. Let us know in the comments if you like this video mailbag edition. We can do them again if you like it. If you hated it, we'll just pretend this never happened and never speak of it again, like the 2023 Orange Bowl. <laughs> like, whatever. It can be memory hold for the rest of the time. I don't care. But anyway, we love you. Subscribe to the X's and Knowles YouTube channel. Subscribe, notifications on, Knowles 24-7. Subscribe, notifications on. If you're not a member of the Knowles 24-7 message board, correct that. Mm-hmm. Correct it now. Yeah. Spring is about to come. And you're about to get a whole bunch of news dropped on your faces. For Adam Brown, for the Snatch Master, Kevin Little, I'm Trey Rowland. We will catch you on the next video. Keep chopping. If you don't join those 24-7, you're going on my punch list. <laughs>